da paz Herói nacional, defensor da cultura e paz Foi traído, perseguido Seus ideais foram oprimidos e subjugados Portanto, o amor ao próximo Paulo foi esse lado a semente com amor e dedicação Com métodos da primária pós-graduação Mais oprimidos, alunos com valores, ético crítico, criador da escola, do saber sobre o poder, que o mundo moderno não mate os nossos sonhos, questiona sempre, inclusive os frenianos, de ciência. Ao aprender emana Reflexão da complexidade humana Paulo Cristão, a base do pensamento racional Ensino é um ato político, cultural Professor Bento 
mais oprimido Alunos com valores Ético, crítico Criador da escola Do saber sobre o poder Que o mundo moderno Não mate os nossos sonhos Questiona sempre Inclusive os frenianos de ciência Reflexão da complexidade humana Palmo cristão a base do pensamento racional Ensino é um ato político cultural É a educação 
educação Pensar transforma, muda É a abolição Freiriana É sua missão Pensar transforma, muda É evolução O conhecimento liberta Vamos transformar Educar o mundo de dentro Pra fora interpretar Solução é alfabetizar, é reinventar Me dê a mão e vamos para a luta já Braços abertos a felicidade encontrar De braços dados vamos ao outro ajudar Paulo, pernambucano, franzino Valente, homem de bem Revolucionário, pensador, além do seu tempo, destemido com o futuro visionário. Você se merece uma estátua, meu rapaz, herói nacional, defensor da cultura e paz. Foi traído. Portanto, o amor ao próximo Paulo foi esse lado Plantou a semente com amor e dedicação Com métodos da primária pós-graduação Mais oprimido, alunos com valores, ético crítico, criador da escola, do saber sobre o poder. Que o mundo moderno não mate os nossos sonhos, questiona sempre, inclusive os freirianos, tudo de ciência. Ao aprender emana Reflexão da complexidade humana Paulo Cristão, a base do pensamento racional Ensino é um ato político cultural Paulo, pernambucano, franzino 
Valente homem de bem Revolucionário Pensador Além do seu tempo Destemido com um futuro visionário Você sim merece uma estátua, meu rapaz Herói nacional, defensor da cultura e paz Foi traído Perseguido Seus ideais foram oprimidos e subjugados Portanto, o amor ao próximo Paulo foi exilado Plantou a semente com amor e dedicação com métodos da primária pós-graduação Good evening. My name is Kimberly Waller, and I have the pleasure of being able to moderate this evening as we join in community conversations about the state of our school system, our education, and looking at education as a community-led um, community spaces that allow for us to have civic engagement and also to, more importantly, to support our children. I wanna thank all of you for coming today. This is actually the final uh, leg of a series for the year of education, which celebrated the 100th anniversary, the centennial for Paulo Freire, and also the 60th anniversary of the Cuban literacy campaign. And if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to see prior episodes, we invite you to go to hothouse.net, hothouse.net, and also many of these conversations have, are archived on YouTube. We've had numerous speakers. We began in September and we've been enlightened by our brothers and sisters who are of indigenous descent, uh, those who talked about the fight for public education in Puerto Rico, Lucha C. Uh, we've seen a number of um, Catherine Murphy's movies who focus in large part on what happened in the Cuban literacy campaign, but also the uh, legacy of Paulo Freire. So we thank you for each of our speakers for the last uh, six or seven months, and for those of you who are joining us this evening. I'm excited to be able to share the stage or share the space with those who are actually active in the community and have been active for a number of years. And that begins with someone close to my hometown in Chicago, and that's Alder woman, Jeanette Taylor. Ms. Taylor became active at the age of 19. She had several children who were part, uh, who were um, attending Chicago public schools. And she decided that she wanted to make a difference and amplify her voice. So she began, became a member of the local school council, had stayed on there for actually several decades, and she now has been able to um, win the seat in the 20th Ward. Uh, 2019, she was elected as, the, uh, as an older woman, and she has continued her fight unapologetically, uh, speaking up for the uh, equity, um, not only in our school system, but in our communities, and making sure that um, our under-resourced spaces are given their just due. So welcome, older woman Taylor. And Mr. Mamut, yes, wonderful. Uh, Mr. Man, uh, Mamut Nuhu, I know Mamut actually from solidarity work in Cuba because he is an international person who has tried to, uh, that knows no borders. He's done most of his work in the San Jose community, but also across the state of, of uh, California. Additionally, Mamut has uh, opened co-opened uh, recently the Kakua Self-Determination Center. And part of what we're talking about this evening is self-determination, our ability and our right to be able to shape curriculum, to shape our story, 
in a way that's reflective of us as um, people of the African diaspora. Um, part of what Ms. Um, Mr. Newhu does at the Kakua Self-Determination Center is provide a platform for children to be able to learn about their history, to be able to engage in physical fitness. And that's an extension of Liberation Gardens, which is a community garden that's designed for the, um, the nutritional um, support of, of those uh, black and brown people. In addition to that, they provide security, they teach self-defense, they are mediation space, um, parenting classes. So there's a number and they, they work in solidarity with other community organizations. So I had the pleasure of, of uh, visiting Kakua and seeing the amazing work that they're, do they're doing as a nonprofit. Um, but perhaps the, the uh, support from the state may be low, but the state, the support from the community is very high. And welcome, Mamut Nuhu. And then we have the husband and wife team, long-term activists, Sam Anderson and Rosemary Mealy. Sam, Mr. Anderson started, at, he's a longtime activist. He started in 1964, actually. And in the civil rights and black liberation movements, he was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC and also one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party in his area. He is a math, he's a retired, but continues to be a teacher, a professor in the area of math mathematics and also teaching our history in a way that is um, unapologetically, unapologetic historical truths. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Anderson. And last but not least, his partner, um, not in crime, but his partner in uh, radical education and revolution is uh, Rosemary Neely. Rosemary Neely is Neely is both a lawyer and uh, was serving as a professor. She has her PhD and looks at uses the lens of Black feminist thought. She is an adjunct right now, assistant professor at City College of New York, CUNY, in interdisciplinary studies. She has a history actually in several chapters of the Black Panther Party. And additionally, she does international work, solidarity work with Cuba and beyond. And all people of the diaspora are that community in which she champions. So thank you for being here, Rosemary Mealy. And what are we here to talk about this evening? The fifth point on the Black Panther Party uh, platform said several things. And Mr. Anderson, being the historian that he, he is, clarified the fact that actually the 10 points were derived from Malcolm X's 13 points that he put forth for the Organization of African uh, Unity. So they were actually slimmed down. These are the ones that were chosen. And the fifth point, which is focused on education, says that they wanted learner knowledge of self grounded in historical truths and teaching the current state of blacks within America. So that is very interesting because right now we're dealing with the issue of critical race theory. So even back then, the, those who were in the movement were saying that we want to know our truths uh, with, a pre, with an approach that is grounded um, in historical context that is American history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in fact, there's someone who said that um, American history is American horror. So that, with that, I would like to turn it over to Sam Anderson. Sam is going to be laying out the historical background for our first movie, which is the 63 Boycott. Um, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Um, this is a very important discussion in terms of looking at our history of the struggle for Black education, quality for Black education. <clears throat> and it did not start with um, the 10-point program of the Black Panther Party. It started back when we came across the Middle Passage and struggled to be maintaining our dignity 
and our history, our culture, and passing that on to um, our fellow enslaved Africans. And it was always a struggle to, to know the world, to learn about the world, struggle against um, the law at the time of slavery, which was no black person should be able to read. Mm. And we fought that. And that that is rooted in 2022 struggle in our communities to um, have control over our education for our children, quality, to develop quality education. And so that, that's the overall historical context. There's a lot of stuff that has obviously has happened all in between that with Carter G. Woodson, Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, you name it. You had um, 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 people um, who were um, struggling to get popular, popularize the education of Black people um, throughout this country, uh, and particularly in, in the South, um, with, with uh, Bethune-Cookman um, and, and so forth. So fast forward to the 1960s and um, the Civil Rights Movement, and particularly the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, forming uh, freedom schools in the, mid in the early to mid 1960s, um, because they saw in the South, the horrendous miseducation or non-education of our children um, coming uh, in, in the rural areas. And so they felt that it was important to have freedom schools and SNCC produced their own material. Um, and, and, and when I say SNCC, I'm, I, what I'm talking about are teenagers, young men and women in their 20s uh, with a handful of old heads in their 30s <laughs> who were members of SNCC at that time. And they, they developed uh, a whole um, coterie of, of um, pamphlets and little books and uh, a teaching style, i.e. a pedagogy that was very inducive to getting uh, young people excited and, and up and moving. You have to understand that young people in the South were in motion. Mm -hmm. the, the, when you look at Birmingham and the demonstrations in Birmingham, or you look at the marches that happened in Birmingham and Mississippi, they were all very young people, teenagers, elementary school students out organizing. So there was a consciousness there and there was a thirst for knowledge. Um, those of us who grew up in the North, like myself, um, we uh, felt that uh, it was also important that when, when we returned, I was in college at Lincoln University, um, and when we, we felt that, many of us felt that when we returned to our areas, we would have to do something uh, very similar in terms of the urban setting. In this period, the most inspirational um, uh, educational development that was happening was the, the very brief life of the organization of Afro-American unity that Malcolm X formed once he left the uh, Nation of Islam in 1964. Uh, it was short-lived because he was assassinated at its birth. And um, inside of that were a lot of young people um, who were eager to deal with dealing with the educational uh, issues of, of the time uh, and, and the whole issue in New York City, not just Harlem, but in New York City was the issue of community control, that we reached a critical mass of black people and, and Puerto Ricans in neighborhoods that we dominated. We were the students in the schools and the educational uh, quality was very bad. And so um, progressive uh, ministers like Reverend Milton Glamison, who was one of the leaders um, in, in, in the community control uh, uh, struggle, struggle in, the in, the, in the mid 1960s, helped to organize uh, parents and students to fight in their respective neighborhoods for control of their schools. And this created a confrontation between um, the predominantly white teachers and the overwhelmingly black and Puerto Rican students uh, and, and, and parents. 
and that tension grew. Um, and, and so uh, by the time we, we formed the Black Panther Party in May of 1966, there was already a community control movement in process. Um, the, uh, Reverend Milton Glamison uh, met, met with Malcolm X in um, early February, late January, um, and, and the idea was in, to, to, to form in New York City this uh, united front of, of uh, uh, activists, Black activists, and that um, Milton Glamison was going to be part of this united front, and part of that united front effort was to begin to build the, the motion, the, the movement for community control of schools and Malcolm and the organization Afro-American Unity was gonna be part of that uh, whole aspect. Uh, as a little historical footnote, um, the day that Malcolm was assassinated, um, he had planned for that following evening, a meeting with uh, the, the black leadership throughout the city to talk about running for city council that mm. Malcolm was going to run for city council in, in his uh, concept of building a power base, building a united front and, and rooting his, his um, political work within the Harlem community, he was going to run uh, for, for city council, but that was short-lived. Obviously he was assassinated on that very same day. No, so, uh, Mr. Anderson, you are an encyclopedia of knowledge and I really have learned from, from your background However, we do want to go to the movie, but it's okay. good to know. You don't know what you don't know. And I think that you have helped to provide uh, the counter narrative because we always thought that the, the points were from the Black Panthers, but actually you're giving us some wonderful background about uh, Malcolm X and what his vision was. Yeah. So I'd like us to prepare for 63 Boycott, which is about the Willis Wagon, the inequity that was happening in 1963 and we'll reflect a little bit upon that. And so you can extend the conversation after we see the movie. Again, the movie is 63 Boycott. It's about the what was happening in Chicago in 1963 and how the community came together across social lines to be able to um, have more equitable educational spaces. Because I want to mine for my freedom right. In 1963, the schools in Chicago were very segregated. Most of these schools that were closed are in black and Latino neighborhoods. This is racist. The Negro the race has just as much right to exercise their talent as the white race. We're taking our case to the street. We're still protesting. But you gotta keep fighting. How could they stop us? Brown versus Board of Education, Chicago schools were racially segregated. All right, boys and girls, any of you tell me what you think the word vanishing means? Audrey? Vanishing means disappearing. Do you see Elmo? Show me. Well, you know, here he is on the giant shoulder. Even as a young person, I could see a difference in the quality of the environment and the resources. The schools in the predominantly white areas of the city had more, and they had better. The books we get, they aren't new books, they are secondhand books. And some of the teachers have explained it to us, and we don't have enough books to go around to each student, so we have to share books. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not getting what I should, because you know, somebody is sharing what I should have all for myself. As a student, 
I was very aggressive on education, but there was a lot of prejudice. You know, you could look someone in the eye and you know what you wanted, but it wasn't being given. At that point, colored kids went to Sexton and the white kids went to Ogden. But my mother got me into Ogden where there were two black students entering high school. I wanted to be a research scientist. I went to my guidance counselor and she said, you have people coming in there with your high ideas and you know, and, and she was very angry and she said, after all, who have you seen who is colored and a girl who is a research scientist and you are colored and a girl. I ended up in vocational school, and I was going to be a secretary. And this was crushing. And back in those days, it was the beginning of a journey to begin to try to understand who we were, who I was, what was this condition that we find ourselves in and my sister, every night, we would just talk about the news, what was going on. Like the Freedom Rides in the South. You're under arrest. One of the avenues for working with the Southern uh, sit-in movement in the 1960s was by establishing groups in northern cities. We were aware of what was taking place in the South. The Chicago area friends of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was really established to raise money for the action in the South. But the conditions in Chicago were so horrendous that it became difficult to only talk about the, uh, the Southern movement. It had to be linked with what was going on here in Chicago. When African Americans started coming here during the Great Migration, they were contained to the Black Belt. Chicago's South Side line of demarcation between black and white runs along the railroad tracks. My mom grew up in Woodlawn, and she saw a massive white flight. You had the real estate industry who were saying, the blacks are coming, you need to get out now while you can. And then you have the racial violence that happened too. The landlord at least the apartment for this Negro family. The tension has grown in the area. But segregation in Chicago was not an accidental matter. The federal government rolled out the red carpet to white flight. There were expressways built for them. Loans were favored to these suburbs. So the federal government aided and abetted segregation. There was people who say, if we integrate the schools, then the whites would flee the city. Benjamin Willis was brought here purposely by the late Richard J. Daly to keep the schools segregated. Superintendent Ben Willis was the segregationist and the, and the racist. The mayor points the Board of Education. Therefore, he has a responsibility as the chief executive of this city to see to it that our schools line up with other schools. And I think the state legislature should pass a law that moved Chicago school board from politics. There was an opportunity for integration to happen when more than half the district was comprised of white students. Why did integration fail in CPS? And I think the very concise short answer would be Richard J. Daley. The people of the Italian 
American, Polish, Lithuanian, German, Croatian, and Irish, in my opinion, are the finest people any place in the United States and any place in the world. My kids were going to school on half-day shifts, the same as I did when, uh, when I was in school, because black schools are overcrowded. If school could be side by side, one would be black, one would be white, one would be comfortable in terms of the number of children in that school, and the other would be overcrowded. Every time a community changed, the Board of Education changed the boundaries. So it would limit our kids' access to other schools that may have had empty classrooms. The Willis wagons were put up on the campus of the black schools in order to contain them. They would take these converted house trailers and turn them into classrooms. Benjamin Willis did not want black kids to be shipped out into white areas. White middle-class families didn't want them there. So it's like, keep these Negroes in their place here. Who do you go to? Uh, Waller right now. Waller? What about Waller School? Well, right now it's in pretty bad shape. Why is it bad shape? It's crowded. They got, you know, mobile schools. I was in the trailer, <laughs> you know, for at, at that age. I just know that I didn't belong in the parking lot. <laughs> and they had the big building there where they had air, all the facilities in it. And we were out in the parking lot. It's like being detained. Education is nurturing. Do you nurture a child by putting them in a trailer? I don't think so. It was just a lot of things uh, psychologically that was wrong with that, with that attitude. And there were parents groups that started to bark up in Chatham and on the west side. We would go around knocking on doors, trying to make people aware why we were demonstrating. We were out to disrupt. We were out to inform. So core Congress for Racial Equality decided to sit in at the Board of Education. And we sat in there for about a week, starving, because we forgot about planning for food, and <laughs> but we had everything else planned. So we've got a lot of PR. Another explosive protest was led by a woman named Rosie Simpson, who had had some union background. I was living in Inglewood. One day, my children came home and said, you know, we're going to start a, in a new school uh, on Monday. And I said, where? Their plans were to build an all-mobile unit school between a railroad track and an alley. We were going to do whatever was necessary to stop them. The members of CORE went up to the top of the pole and wouldn't come down. We would lay down in front of the bulldozers. We bought chains to lock ourselves to the police cars. The police were horrible out there. And we met with the mayor and the Board of Education. Oh, Mr. Simpson, you say that it's going to stop. Even after communicating with the board, we are not going to get any place. So this is why I hesitate to say that I am ready to call off demonstrations. I have just placed on the desk of the president of the Board of Education and the deputy superintendent of schools a copy of my resignation. And I really think he was bluffing. The Board of Education refused to accept his resignation, and that 
Uh, back then, it's a boy cat. I was on the Coordinating Council for Community Organization, and we met and decided on all city boycott. The Coordinating Council put Larry Landry in charge, and all the parents were in agreement. We had leaflets, thousands of leaflets. We would give the little kids leaflets to bring home to their parents. We put leaflets on the L and on the buses. We had jitneys, black cab drivers, and they would hand out flyers. I was standing at supermarkets talking to parents about uh, keeping your kids home from school. This is why. Why are you out of school today? Because today is Freedom Day. Why, Ma? Because I want to march for my freedom rights. <laughs> if I don't go to school, I'm a march. Yeah, me too. Some uh, teachers have been saying that if you uh, stay out of school today, then they'll, you know, give you Ds. They'll fail you for the day. Now, I'm not afraid of myself, but they don't threaten me. Oh, we're praying to hide no students there at all. I wish the whole school was empty. And we were being told, I mean, if you really cared about these children, you wouldn't be taking them out of school. You would be insisting that they stay in school. We had several meetings in order to organize uh, freedom schools. The students would be in churches and in community centers, learning black history. Now, Little Blue and Little Yellow were friends. And one day, they went out to play with each other. And you know what happened? They turned green. <laughs> we sang freedom songs. We talked to the young people about the purpose of the boycott. And before I be unsafe, I'll be buried in my grave. And go home to my Lord and be saved. The boycott was to be a learning experience. This is your future that you're fighting for. I feel that segregation by school is all wrong. Why is it all wrong? Because why, why should your child go to a different school than my child? I feel that uh, my child, your child, should be able to go to the same school. I think, I think it shouldn't be no mobile school, you No more what? No mobile school, it's too small. That day, it was all over the school. And we're gonna go downtown and protest. And the next thing I know, we're in the march. On the day of the boycott, I was very concerned with the way I would look. I certainly would want either my gold chain or my pearls. I wanted to look like someone who should have an education. People march from the north side, at the west side, the south side, and meet at downtown. Don wrote the words using this land is your land and it was used 
on a sound trucks. It was also on the radio, if I'm not mistaken. We managed to get that played on the midnight special on WFMT. Hmm, that was in my folk singing days. We hadn't heard that in a long time. <laughs> And folks put together a long, long banner. That was dropped from the Board of Education. And if you would have walked into our central operation, you would have thought you were looking at an aldermanic or a congressional campaign. Yes, that's the figure right there. We're keeping score like election returns. We go through those schools, we get calls, I, I'm in uh, such and such a school, and there's nobody here. Forestville North has got eight students in it, and out of a total enrollment of 1,200. Ten schools. Ten schools. We don't have ten. That's a big one. 124 kids in, 2,500. Just a moment, I'll let you talk to our PR person. Mr. Rose! Carl Dunn Rose speaking. This is an overwhelming success, right. At least 15 schools that we can say have a virtual total boycott. And all these schools are being picketed by parents in the community. Uh, there was a 13-point uh, set of demands sent to the mayor, to Dr. Willis, and to the school board. We started the march from St. Matthew's Methodist Church. People were laughing along the entire route. It was a carnival until we reached the river and the downtown area. That's when the voices started echoing off of the large buildings. And that's when the mood changed. The system was now serious. Just an ocean of people saying, we were right, I was right. Forget some instructor who said that I was colored in a girl. I was going to be a research scientist. When we planned that march, we knew that most of them would be young people. And so the effort was to be disciplined, don't cause any problems, because you could get a whole bunch of people hurt. You had a lot of uh, members of CORE and SNCC who was organizing, and they were committed to nonviolence. Downtown, they were so fearful that they'd be rioting. But the children of Chicago had shown the very best of themselves in the way they comported themselves that day. 250,000 students, with the permission of their parents, stayed away from school. It was like a proud thing to do. It was, you know, we were, we were protesting, you know, about some system that was not correct. The feeling was excitement, you know, hope. We've accomplished something. Especially in the black newspapers. But based upon white the reporting, it was never successful. But it was a success. And at that time, we knew why. Because hair count. They get paid based upon how many kids show up in school. So it hurt them from a financial standpoint. Those dollars that disappeared that day, that clicked. 
for the very first time, the city administration gave a racial headcount of the Chicago public school system, showing that African-Americans constituted half or slightly more of the entire public school population. Before the boycott, parents were not allowed in the schools. They would lock the doors on us. But it sort of opened it up for us that we could go up to the school. We were encouraging parents to get involved in the PTAs. I think the, the public support increased for the movement in Chicago. But as a result of the boycott, we did not gain any leverage with Benjamin C. Willis nor the Board of Education. Board of Education did not change their mind about the mobile classrooms. And there was a second boycott in 1964. There were groups all over the country interested in what we were doing. And in Chicago, smaller protests continued during that period. It took years, but ultimately Willis did leave. At the same time, Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was planning to deal with problems of segregation in the North. The atmosphere was created last summer for the building of a vibrant movement to end discrimination and slumism in the city of Chicago. I'm still convinced there's nothing more powerful to dramatize and expose the social evil than the tramp tramp of marching feet. We saw more than 100 days of marching last summer. That does not mean that any fundamental problems of this school system have been solved. The revolution of human rights in Chicago is far from over. In fact, it has just begun. The education in Chicago is as bad now as it was then, I think. The black and the Hispanic community should be up in arms. The way they implement these racist policies looks a lot nicer and politer than it used to. There's no dogs out with the cops this time, but it absolutely has the same impact. This is the largest uh, single group of school closures anywhere in the country. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Cannot rest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Cannot rest? We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. It is difficult to talk about integration in CPS when you have only 9% of the district today being white students. A lot of the whites left the public schools. Some went to private, some went to par parochial schools, and some moved out of the city, you know. What we saw was underperforming schools close, and those students go to other underperforming schools. Why not think about getting some of these poor black children into well-resourced schools? But we don't really invest in the neighborhood. I go to Lane Tech College Prep, which is on the north side of Chicago, um, in the Lakeview area. But I live on the south side, which is in Inglewood. In order to get a better, better education, I have to sit on the bus for an hour and a half. I don't think the powers that be want public education to exist. Charter school. It's nothing but another word for private school. Charter schools ought to break the unions, and that's the way I see it. didn't listen, so we're out in these streets and we're going to continue to be out in these streets until he does right by these kids. 
These are our kids, these are our schools, you work for us. Today, we are boycotting to show that standardized testing should not decide the future of our schools for students. I met a woman who went to my school back in the 60s and she said they were boycotting the same thing. We're going to make history today again, like the 1963 boycott. We're going to show Run what it's all about, what the students can do. We're not just students, but we are organizers, we are powerful leaders, and we are the future. So just waiting for him to come out, if he's not scared still, to come talk to us. Would I march right now? In a heartbeat. I think the boycott produced a product. Not the school system, the education of going after education produced me. I wanted to be a businessman. This I started a photography company. It allowed me to become the architect that I am, to try to solve some of the problems we have in America. I remember learning when I went to, to social work school that children rise or fall to the level of your expectations. Our way out has been education, which is why early on, we were not allowed to be educated at all. You know, you could be punished for, for teaching a, you know, a black person, a slave, how to read and write. Education is all right. We will go without a fight. After the boycott, I've continued to organize parents, but I realized that housing, education, and jobs was interconnected. You needed to be looking at the whole picture. I became an educator, and we started our own school. We would have an African-centered curriculum. We don't understand it, what education is really for. It's not just to get a job. It has to do with helping human beings create or recreate themselves. There have been times where I felt alone. As one of the few black females getting a degree, but I've never forgotten that people marched for me to get where I am. That mass of people are still there. They're cheering on some hill for me. And you don't forget the people marched for me. Freedom now, freedom now, freedom now. Who would have thought that the city that was considered for many years the most segregated city in America would become an exemplar for a fight for community control, community activism, and more importantly, what we saw in the end, community empowerment. I would like for us to engage in a conversation right now. We have about 10 minutes with our distinguished guest and let us know, let the audience know what you felt about that and how it relates to the Black Panther Party um, foundational piece or today. Hi, Kimberly, thank you so much. Um, and good evening to everyone. That was a, a powerful uh, documentary and it, and it reminded me of my own uh, education growing up in the South in segregated schools uh, which again um, 
really forced me in a sense to recreate, to contribute to recreating a, a new society of There's a pause, which you know this is live television. So sometimes on Zoom we have a a break, and then when the person can join. But, um, us. Yeah. So my uh, inter uh, I, what I what I was saying is that I, I was really impressed by the documentary and reminded myself of my own upbringing and education in in Virginia in, in segregated public schools, which uh, really. Uh, just Chicago was it was just like that and and still is and around this country Let, let's fast forward to um, the Black Panther Party um, and Kimberly you've mentioned the the significance and Sam also mentioned the significant significance of the Black Panther Party's um, 10 point program and platform but particularly the the part of the platform that stated that we um, to our people we wanted to expose the bankruptcy, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, we wanted to expose the bankruptcy of the educational system in this country. And the only way to do that, first, you had to know yourself. You had to know who you are before you could engage and, and, and tell other people what they should be doing. And I think that the party, in a sense, uh, replicated some of that history that's Perhaps uh, Dr. Mealy will be talking about the fact that there were political circles, there were reading circles that were designed to give political literacy to those who were involved. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Mealy. Well, that's true. And, and those, those circles occurred internally with party members uh, by educating ourselves first. Of course, um, some folk would, uh, would, would not understand the fact that a lot of our education was based in critical theory. Uh, in, in understanding dialectical materialism, understanding the history of why you're here, who you're here, and where you're going to go. And so internally, the education was very important. And of course, we extended that internal education to our liberation schools and our freedom schools, where we had community children coming in in the mornings, uh, much like what happened with the breakfast program. Uh, in, in the summertime, uh, particularly I was in New Haven, Connecticut, and, and also I was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in those two areas, where we would actually take the children out into the community, where you could use the community as a framework for teaching the children. You could teach them about why we needed better housing by looking at the housing stock in the community. You would teach the children about um, health care by showing them the surroundings and the environment and how we needed to take care of the environment and how you couldn't have good health care if you were living in a, in a community that was rat infested. And so you use the community as a laboratory to teach. And I think that that was really important of, of the party actually bringing that that part of the platform into the community. I would like to know also, that was wonderful, what others have to think about. Um, sometimes they talk about an education sacrifice zones, those children who aren't necessarily considered valuable enough for that investment. And I believe what Dr. Mealy is talking about, shifting from the acknowledgement that you're in a sacrifice zone to being able to recognize the community wealth, the uh, cultural wealth, the cultural strengths of the place in which you reside and being proud of being a, a member of, of the neighborhood that um, from which you, from which you're from. And that is uh, something that I think um, Brother Mahmoud, you can talk about for a few minutes what you're trying to do in terms of the Kakua Self-Determination Center. Greetings, everybody. Uh, yes, I am Brother Minister Mahmoud Rari Nahu. Um, I'm here in California. Uh, thank you all for joining. But yes, that is exactly what we're trying to do. Some of the things that you heard our, our sister Rosemary uh, Mealy speak about um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, the House of San Kofa, I'm a minister there at the House of San Kofa. We always teach that all history is a current event. So there are certain things we can look at uh, historically 
that our, that our elders and our ancestors lay down and we can pull from that. Now, of course, with the contemporary reality, we have to add to that. And so some of the things that uh, our sister just mentioned, we're doing the same thing. Uh, we've opened up a center with the, with the focus on ensuring that our people have access to proper education because education is the word that's thrown around. Uh, and, I, and I'm with uh, Dr. Khalid Muhammad when he said, if they don't treat you right, how can they teach you right? So we can't complain about what we're getting from the folks if we're not willing to put our, you know, put our pants on or, or our dresses or whatever and get, get it out there in the community and do the work. So what we've done is we've opened up a center, we call it Kakua, the Self-Determination Center. And here we're in California. Uh, and here what we do uh, at this center, we focus on bringing our community in here and, and providing the space. So we have uh, classes in health and nutrition, uh, physical fitness. We teach about nutricide, nutritional genocide. We also have a, a garden, a community garden we call Liberation Gardens, where we take our folks out there and teach them about, you know, the issues around the food that, that we receive in the gas stations and at the grocery stores and the liquor stores and so on and so forth. But it's one thing to talk about the problem and not present the people with a solution. So we teach our folks how to, how to engage in gardening, how to identify a seed that's going to produce fruit years to come versus a seed that's supposed to only pr pr uh, produce fruit for that one year. Uh, we teach the folks how to maintain healthy soil to ensure that we can continue to have gro uh, crops growing throughout the, throughout the, uh, the years. Uh, we teach self-defense. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, our children, they have a certain level of confidence whenever they're entering any building or they're going anywhere. We want to make sure when they walk through that folks are clear that uh, these aren't the kids that you want to try to snatch up. We want to make sure that our kids uh, leave that impression on other kids too, to encourage them to train, exercise, eat healthy, and so on and so forth. But it's not only uh, focusing on the kids, because honestly, as much as we work with the kids, in all reality, those kids have to go home. So we want to make sure that those parents and those grandparents, to the best of our ability, we equip them with the knowledge uh, that they need to continually, continuously uh, nurture these youth to help build them up to be the future leaders. So uh, we have parenting workshops. We have workshops to teach parents how to engage with the youth in, in these times. And also we teach the youth how to engage with the parents and explain to the youth why the parents are the way they are, what they're trying to do and asking them serious questions. If you had a daughter or you had a son, would you let him or her go run out and do this, that and the third? So, you know, we have arts and craft here. Uh, we have arts and crafts day for the kids. Uh, and also during the time, and I want to be very transparent, when the kids are doing arts and craft, the parents, we're here organizing. We're organizing clothes drives, food drives, you know, and letting the kids see us do this. We're meeting up with other organizations, grassroots organizations, and other professional organizations that's doing work uh, for our community, or at least, let me say this, they're getting funded to do work in our community. So since we know you're getting money to do this work with our, with our people, we're encouraging y'all to come to the center to sit down and let's talk about how that's manifested. So the kids see that, they see uh, the solidarity work amongst the professionals, amongst the street nations, as folks call the gang members, uh, amongst the people, the students, uh, from elementary all the way on up to folks getting their doctor's degrees. We make sure that our people are, are working together uh, and, and, and focusing on, like I say once again, this ideal of self-determination. Uh, in, in the spirit of self-determination, we're here in California, folks are always talking about earthquakes and so on and so forth, but we want to make sure that our people sit down and put together a plan, a, a very uh, precise and, and clear plan on what we're to do. We have the kids, they come, they learn in the center what they're supposed to do. We equip them with PowerPoints, and then their job is to go home and teach their parents, their other brothers and sisters. So they, 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 uh, they're not only learning the information, we've learned that the best way to learn something and retain it is to teach it. So we challenge them with that. And if they do what they're supposed to do, we offer them things to put in their emergency bags, whether it be uh, um, sleeping bags, tents, you know, other emergency equipment. So like I said, we're, we're here to focus to make sure that we're clear to, to our people. Uh, this system has done everything they can to destroy us. This system is doing everything they can to, to dis, the, the, uh, dismantle our will to want to learn, dismantle our will to want to come together and, and unify. So we're you know clear on that. But uh, there you have your what you're doing is so rich. I want to make sure we have time after this movie so you can kind of we can extend that conversation. But I think what you've been tra talking about is that the teaching is just as important as the learning. The oh, learning sure. is just as important as uh, the teaching and that the culturally engaged approach 
allows us to be able to um, not only feel good about ourselves and the, our cultural wealth, um, but also be able to communicate that with, um, with others. And I'd like to turn for a moment to a person who actually had a cameo appearance. I don't know if you recognized her in uh, 63 Boycott, and that is Alder woman, uh, Jeanette Taylor. And she will be introducing our next movie. It's a short film about Diet High School, which is, we understand, the only school in the history of the United States, which was uh, closed as an open enrollment school and because of the community fight, opened again as an open enrollment school. So would you like to talk a few minutes and give us some historical grounding, uh, all the woman Taylor? Sure, but I'll start with, until lions have their own historians, the tale of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. And so mm -hmm. it's amazing to see this film and a cameo, but it shows you how your life comes in full circle. Dr. Timuel Black was instrumental in us starting the diet hunger strike. And Bob Lucas was actually the executive director of the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. And so even though I came after him being executive director, I'm honored to see those folks in the, the film. Um, it's 2000 and 22, and we're in two pandemics, uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 and racism. And we've been in the racism pandemic for 400 years. And so I'm glad that we're, we're honestly having these conversations, but it's also hurtful. Um, I remember Dr. King saying, we shall overcome. And I tell people all the time, we ain't overcome, but we come. And so the thought that we have um, folks on this call who started the fight for us. I'm forever grateful for you. Um, Ella Baker said it better than anybody else. You got to sit at the feet of the elders to learn for history not to repeat itself. And so um, I'm grateful for the elders on the call and I look to learn from you all. Um, going on a hunger strike in 2015 was a shock. Um, it was hurtful. Um, I cried every day because I couldn't believe in one of the richest countries um, in the world that you got to go on hunger strike for something that's supposed to be your right as an American citizen. As a United States citizen, I have the right to a free quality education. And in 2022, that's still not what young people get. <clears throat> so the thought that we got a country that won't even apologize, but we will go and rescue everybody else. And so I'm amazed that we got all this support for Ukraine, but you can't support the people who built this country for free for you. And so we still writing on reparations. Like you talking about Juneteenth. I don't need another paid holiday. I need to be able to be paid for what my people pay for. And so uh, I'm glad to have this conversation. And I don't, I don't know how we move forward. You know, 2020 and 2021, we saw a lot of riots. We saw a lot of rising up. And of course, who is always at the forefront of that? Young people. People forget Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were young people. Who, who started the fight and who will lead us. And I say all the time, this generation ain't lost, has been neglected. And we gotta own that. And sometimes we don't. And so how do we move forward? And it's by teaching, it's by us sitting at the feet of the elders. It's about us learning the mistakes, us learning how to change the dynamics. And to be honest, this is a system that we should have let go in the, in the 60s. We should have freedom schools. How are you going to allow, Malcolm X said, how are you going to allow the enemy to teach our children? And it's just no matter how hard we fight, no matter how many hunger strikes, no matter how many protests we go on, this system just doesn't respect black and brown folks. And let's, let's just call it what it is. And so I'll stop there because I'm, 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 I'm anxious to hear from my, the elders on the call and you can come back to me. Wonderful, thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, a great uh, historical background. You were a person who engaged in a hunger strike, and in the end, this will be an example of resiliency, community resiliency. And so, our next movie is Thirty Four Days. So Walter Diet was known as um, the star maker in Bronzeville, he, who was a, a brilliant music instructor. 
So in 1972, Diet Middle School was built in his honor. But in 1999, as this community, Bronzeville, was gentrifying, Martin Luther King High School was transformed into Martin Luther King College Prep. Children that lived across the street from King could no longer go. The Chicago Public Schools, with three months' notice, told the local school council at Diet that they would, go, they would start accepting freshmen, as there were no honors or AP classes. Um, so Diet never had the support to be a functional high school um, that really met the needs of children in the neighborhood. We had to fight for everything that we got. I just feel like it's unfair to me and all my classmates and everybody else in my community. Okay, with the same year that Diet was turned to a high school, the same year that King College Prep was turned to select and enroll in my high school, and they received $25 million while Diet received little to no resources. A lot of resources that Diet have been taken away. I've been at Diet for four years, and I've seen a lot of after-school programs, teachers, classes, and stuff like that took away. And then they start pushing towards zero tolerance a lot, and that starts to force young people to get kicked out of Diet, and young people to leave, you know, just because of the hard discipline policies. So young people at Diet began to work to change the culture of the school themselves. That they had this freshman connection program where you would be able to meet with seniors in the school and you would be able to talk to the principal and you got guys going on trips. Uh, in 2008, we had the largest increase of students going to college in CPS. Uh, we had the largest decrease in arrests and suspensions. We had a nationally recognized uh, restorative justice program. And you saw the climate in the school began to change. And a lot of good things started to happen. Because Diet was never given the support from the district to be a successful school. This was a community-driven effort to improve this school. And in 2011, we won the ESPN Rise Up Award. Diet High School is a good school. The kids here are good kids. But due to our inadequate funding, it's hard for us to fund our athletic teams. It's my pleasure to announce officially that Rise Up is coming to Diet High School. over 500 schools around the country uh, as a small school that was doing great things but needed help. It provided over like four million dollars for our school so it like revamped the gymnasium. We got a complete renovation of our, our athletic facilities, uh, uh, college level weight room, um, a brand new gymnasium equipment and everything like that and then the next year they phased the school out. I remember like um, 2011 they came out with this like paper that was saying that Dyer High School was um, going to possibly be voted to phase out in like in December and they were saying that the school was underperforming and we was just standing up there and I remember like the board just saying that they voted anonymously to um, close and phase out Dyer High School and you, I'm not, I, remember, I can remember the, like the crowd you know just being in shock like uh, we all came up here and we, you know, we expressed like how devastating this is for the community and they just decided to close our schools with, without even listening to us. So I felt really bad. I just knew I wasn't valued and at that time I was just very discouraged. I didn't, I just really believed like, oh, I can't go to college. Like, you know, I'm not even, I'm not college material. Um, we got to do so much just to get a good education. Diet was our last open enrollment neighborhood high school. If I pay taxes in this community, I have the right to have a good high school within walking distance of my home that my child has a right to go to because we live in the neighborhood. Who school? Our school. Who school? Our school. Who school? Our school. We began fighting back. We began doing sit-ins at the mayor's office. Uh, we began disrupting school board meetings. We chained ourselves outside the mayor's office. We're not really valued as a people. If nobody is going to do it, it's going to have to be us. And we had like press conferences, uh, we uh, rallied. Me and some students, uh, we filed Title VI Civil Rights, uh, which like prohibits discrimination in uh, race and color. There was a lot of work done, a lot of rolling our sleeves up, uh, connecting with young people, um, making sure they had community resources and we eventually developed the full proposal for Diet Global Leadership at Green Technology High School as the hub of what we call a sustainable community school village. The fight for Diet is really about the fight for our right to remain in this historic black community. 
because in addition to them trying to shut down our schools, they've closed our hospitals, they closed the police station, uh, we've lost grocery stores, uh, affordable housing is disappearing. We need to be fighting to make sure that they get what they deserve. I'm not going to accept my son because he's black and America is racist. He's not going to get a world-class education. I'm just not. So, and we, none of us should. So we should push these decision makers to the edge of the earth. We can talk about what we're going to do all the day. What's the action to get what it is we need for young people? We have to be prepared to struggle outside of the acceptable protest playbook. Um, they know that we'll rally. They know that we'll, do, we'll march. They know that we'll testify at the hearings and we'll get loud and we'll be upset, and, and rightfully so. And maybe that's where we start. But we have to be prepared to disrupt normal operations to the point where they can't function. CPS decided to reverse the decision to phase our diet came as a result of pressure from parents, community right. members, and students. Right. Instead of honoring the community plan and believing in democracy, Alderman Will Burns has given diet over to private operators. What do we want? I am inspired by the Little Village hunger strike because they had a school built from the ground up. And so I'm here waging a hunger strike till we get the school because I believe in the school and I believe in our proposal. Well, if I have to go without food to have a neighborhood school that my grandkids will still be able to go to, by any means necessary, you know, whatever I have to do, you know, we need to take it back. This is ours. Only way to teach your children to fight is for them to see you fight. Because it's like I'm not valued as a black mother. It's something a parent, a mom would do, her instinct. You know, eating at this point, it wouldn't even go down. reopening diet as a public open enrollment neighborhood school. This hunger strike has let ordinary people know that you, you can fight. As long as you have the will, there are people around the country who supported you. It was, it, it was a righteous fight that I think it touched people's hearts because people all over the country feel disenfranchised. So we had support from Istanbul, Turkey, from Johannesburg, South Africa, from France, uh, from all over this country, uh, people uh, connected to the fight for diet. 
the hunger strike brought people together across race. I saw white mothers having an emotional response to this and standing with us. The diet hunger strike is really a blueprint for unity. You saw multiracial folks, um, you saw um, different ages, you saw people from all walks of life come together and say um, they're going to support a righteous fight for young people in the Kenwood, Oakland um, and Bronzeville neighborhood to get their just due when it comes to education. Um, that was like a real groundbreaking moment knowing that I had people <clears throat> who actually cared about me. <laughs> The Diet of Hunger Strikers really did a lot for us. Hunger Strike um, really provided hope for many um, students and youth and parents and teachers in my community because it, it, really, it really showed how the community was coming together on this issue and um, how they was fighting to make sure that we had a good quality um, school in our neighborhood. The key thing is just to never give up. So. And in the fall of 2016, young people from my neighborhood would be able to go to Diet High School. And so for me, it, it was worth it. Our curriculum team will be doing professional development for the teachers so that uh, global leadership in green technology is a strong part of the curriculum. Um, also, Diet will be a community school, which means that it will be open to 7, 8 p.m with uh, programs and initiatives for the young people. But it's a lesson learned that people, multi-generational, multi-race folks, can get together and, and kill the privatization movement. Another story of Black community resilience. And we're excited because tonight, we actually have one of those protagonists uh, from this story, the now alderman, Jeanette Taylor. And I was wondering if you could tell us, what, what is it like to see that movie now, seven years later? So you noticed I kept turning the camera off because I was crying. Oh. You, you do stuff because you know it's the right thing to do. And the thought that in 2015, black and brown students are still treated as if it's 1950, um, says a lot about this system and says a lot about the United States. And so it's hard to watch. I, this is probably the third time that I've watched it because um, I had to live it. Um, imagine going home to your children, fixing dinner and you can't eat. Imagine still going to local school council meetings and shopping and doing the regular normal things and you're fighting for young people in your community. Um, some of the things that you all didn't see um, in the film was, it was hard. The city sent people to fight with us. They barbecued where we were on a hunger strike. Um, it got so bad with people antagonizing us that Rainbow Push, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who was, was Coco's first executive director, allowed us mm -hmm. to sleep in a church because it had gotten so bad. And so um, it's hard. It's hard because you think in 2015, this is a different country and it's the same country that it's always been, a racist place that won't adhere to what black people have contributed to this country. Um, it's ultimately how I wind up becoming a hold the woman Jeanette Taylor, because no matter how much we protest, no matter, no matter how many hunger strikes we go through, no matter what we're doing as a people until we're able to get into politics, because it gets into us every day and make some decisions that affect our people, 
we will always be treated as third class citizens. It's funny, they opening up the country to everybody else but still disrespect black folks, people who build this country for free. And so seeing that is, is, is hurtful, but it's also helpful because what it teaches us is when we fight, we win. And so that fight wasn't just 34 days. We have been working on education in Chicago for years. Um, even as a 19 year old, imagining trying to organize parents just to get the dirty curtains that have been hanging up for 30 years taken down or getting some new ones or making sure young people have gym uniforms or imagine not having a school that has internet access when you know schools in different communities has it. And so I'm grateful to those other brave souls because it was not an easy decision. And what people don't know was um, two years prior, there was a hunger strike. It only lasted for 19 days um, in the little village community. And those families got a school built from the ground. And so they actually helped us go on the hunger strike. And so it shows our black and brown solidarity, which too often they have us fighting each other. And so a learning lesson for me, um, after the hunger strike, I didn't want to fight anymore. I kept feeling like we wasn't winning. And I felt like no matter what I did, this wasn't going to change. Um, but how do you kill a community? And I'll stop at that. You take away the schools, you take away the hospitals, you take away grocery stores, mm -hmm. and they've done that historically in Chicago on the South and West side. But what's even more disheartening is they did it in New Orleans. They did it in Newark. They did it in Pittsburgh. They did it in Baltimore. And so everywhere we are, they, they figure out how to create chaos, but they want to be like us. Everything you love about the United States came from black people. You can thank us. Music, food, and the list goes on and on. Let, let me say, um, my sister, that I apologize if this was re-traumatizing for you, but I do appreciate the fact that you are willing to engage in a courageous conversation. And I think that that also points to the fact that schools are known as that one space in America, not faith houses, not a, uh, you know, community organizations, but a school is that place where we can have that civic engagement. And we are now facing what they call civic deserts. That means places where we can't have conversations about um, difficult topics, that we can't exchange ideas and build upon that. So when you close a school, you close an opportunity for discussion, an opportunity for the democratic values of justice, of tolerance, of, of, um, of freedom, we close down those opportunities. It's not just about the school and children having to go right. to different places and inconvenience. It's about what this means to the, the uh, fabric of our, of our nation, which is moving towards a democracy, but not quite, uh, particularly when it comes to, uh, to, our historic, to our legacies. But thank well, you for that. The, all the way. They're the last and, stable uh, foundations that we have in the community and they are destroying them as we speak. They didn't bought the black yeah. churches. They we got poverty pill pastors. Anywhere that we kind of has been our home, they figured out how to make them places of chaos. And so if we don't have schools, what do we have? If we don't have schools, what do we have? That's an excellent, that's an excellent question. And I think as a teacher, what made me uh, it made me angry when I saw it, but what really made me angry that we were talking about um, off camera was the fact that I didn't hear the story. I didn't know about the story because it was essentially um, silenced. And that goes back to us telling our own narratives. So I would like to switch to Rosemary and Sam. Uh, speaking of narratives, they are both published authors and to give them a moment to talk about what they're doing in the present day, particularly in the digital realm that connects our, our young activists who have the feet, who have the energy with our veteran activists who um, have a, a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom that can, that can go across uh, generational lines. Are Rosemary and Sam with us? Are they taking a still photo? To translate the everyday experiences, to translate activism into uh, a narrative that um, 
that my students can understand. And, and I have um, one of my books is titled Fidel and Malcolm X, because there's always been a lot of interest in um, Malcolm's uh, meeting Fidel Castro in 1960 at the Hotel Teresa in Harlem. And so I was challenged to, to, write, that, to write that history. But I didn't do it as a as an academic, you know, that I, I didn't just decide that I was going to write this. Stuff. But what I did was I went back to the community and I did oral histories of those who were a part of that history, uh, even even in Cuba, uh, interviewing folk who came to Harlem uh, with Fidel and, Fid and interviewing Fidel himself. And then putting that history in context, written in, in a language, in, 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 in a narrative form that young people can, can understand it, can read it. And then they can do whatever they want to do with it by carrying that information back to their peers. Uh, the book is published by Black Classic Press, uh, which is an, an, another phenomenon. Uh, the, the publisher of Black Classic Press is actually a brother, Paul Coates, who was in the Black Panther Party with me. That's Ta-Nehisi Coates' father. And so he's created a space for us to, to, to publish, to have our works published. The other uh, book that I did was really my dissertation, where I was really interested in knowing what happened to those brothers and sisters who were expelled from historically Black colleges for participating in the sit-in movement. And that's a part of our history we don't know anything about. And so there's a book about, about that. It's a library book. You can basically get it in libraries. It's too expensive. Publishers make it too expensive to buy. But what you do is you take chapters of the book and you, you translate it and you share it with students and they reproduce it. And so that's a piece of history that's not just for Black History Month. Uh, this, is, this is shared and discussed and talked all throughout the year. I'm also fortunate that I can design my own curriculum. I am a, um, this is interesting. My scholarship is critical race theory. So right now there's, there's this whole buzz about critical race theory. Critical race theory is nothing about, it's all about teaching black history, teaching the history of African culture. And so the right wing has taken that theory and attempted to translate it into a political, to weaponize it in a sense. And so what we do in, in, in my, with my students and in the community with young people, we, we teach the truth, we, we share the truth and we take you know, before COVID, we were organizing delegations of young people to go to Cuba, where they can actually see and experience for themselves what a, what a socialist society is like, what education is like. And so you, you take those, you, you use those opportunities to take the young people outside of their environment. You're not trying to make them, uh, you don't want, you're not saying to them, you have to duplicate and replicate what you see in a socialist society, but certainly their values that you can take from that and you can come back and you can structure institutions that are quite different from what they know. So those are just a couple of things. And then of course, I do go into the prisons before COVID working with brothers and sisters who are um, attempting to get asylum in this country, political asylum, which they never get. But while you're there, you begin to interrogate another wealth of, uh, of information. And perhaps Sam will talk for a moment and then we're going to talk about current movements with uh, Mamut, who's going to, Brother Mamut, who will talk a little bit more about the Kakua uh, Self-Determination Center. Uh, um, published by Writers and Readers um, and, and it's available uh, in a number of places. And uh, it was done to begin to have people who ordinarily don't read um, to start to read about their history. Because <clears throat> if a beginner series is a docu-comic type, in other words, it's a serious work surrounded by illustrations on every page. And the language I try to keep very simple. It's a way of introducing uh, folk young and old into black history. Once they read this book, it, it's an inspiration to move forward with um, other topics. Um, the other thing is in terms of contemporary work, I am a member of the New York Coalition 
to finally end mayoral control. Uh, mayoral control in New York City has been around since um, 2002, oh. that's 20 years. Uh, there's two generations of students who have suffered through mayoral control. And, and it's a big, big challenge, big challenge for us to um, end it. And not only end it, but we also have a vision of how the school can be governed grounded in education as a human right, grounded in anti-racist uh, curriculum, grounded in an anti-sexist curriculum, and grounded in the idea that parents have a say in, every, in everyday operations in each and every school, and so, so do the students. And we structure, we have a governance structure that allows that to happen in, in one of the most diverse school systems in the world. Wow, that's exciting. I look forward to what those next steps are. Quality education is a human right. One of the co-sponsors this evening, the Literacy Project, which documents literacy movements from around the world. I think definitely that echoes their, um, the ethos of that organization. And I know that there's so much that you all have to share. The way to be able to get in contact with uh, Sam is through the Mr. Anderson is through the, uh, he's under Black Educator on Facebook. Right. Facebook. Also, all the, all the woman Taylor, every type of social media. Uh, we know that you're also accessible in your office and always welcoming to constituents and non-constituents alike in terms of uh, sharing your time and of course resources. And I would like to now shift to current movements and end with Mamut Nuhu. And I think that when we talk about a passion for something, when we talk about changing wow. policy, I think about Michael Brown and the way that he was murdered. And people just had so much energy. I mean, they just rose up. But I asked myself as an educator, where were they when that baby in kindergarten through 12th grade was in a failing school district? for 12 long years, we allowed Ferguson, Missouri, that public education to be a sacrifice zone. It was a sacrifice zone. So perhaps his death was brutal and it was hard to see and it galvanized a lot of people. But what about that slow death, that slow devaluing of him over those years, over 12 long years. And I'm sure there were educators who were in the fight to make a difference, but ultimately, what did our state do? What did the state of Missouri do? And what did our country do? And I think it's fitting to, to go to the Kakua Center because they're fighting uh, not just uh, to re-educate the children, decolonize the mind, but once you take something out, you gotta put something back in. So could you share with us a few minutes, uh, Brother Mamut, before we wrap up for the evening? Yeah, so as a longtime organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, I learned the important difference between being a reactionary and someone who has an organized plan response, a revolutionary. So I took those, those principles, things that I learned uh, growing up uh, in the party and used those skills. Um, you know, working on solidarity movements, we, we've seen that with the NNOC and uh, all these other organizations that we're a part of. And what we saw was uh, they, they did it uh, back in the day for a different reason. Now uh, there's more divide in, in the community. In, in my opinion, there's more divide amongst our people. So we took that same uh, platform, so to speak, and used that in organizing our people. We made sure that um, we, we engaged with the folks in, in the prisons, what we call the Prison of People Program. We made sure from there we engaged with the street nations. We made sure we engaged with the professionals. We made sure we engaged with the community organizers, uh, grassroots organ organizations, uh, community-based organizations. And so what we did was we looked at all of the folks uh, that was providing different services for our community and sat down with those folks to figure out how. Uh, we have an organization called Culturally Coordinated Services and we work out of Kakua. And uh, what we did was we made sure that um, all of our organizations that was doing this work with our people, we figured out how can we bring everybody to the table? How can we ensure that if a, a young baby comes in and says, 
Uh, you know, I need food. How do we get this baby connected to food? If a mother comes in and says she's stressing out, raising her children, how can we give her some relief? How can we say, hey, drop your kids over here. We'll, we'll give them some quality uh, education while they're here and you go take some time to do what you need to do. Uh, so that's what we did with Kakua. We, we linked up with an uh, organization called Ujima Adult Family Services. That's a system that's been providing uh, therapeutic and behavioral health support to our people for over 30 years. We hooked up with the Roots Clinic. Uh, they provide uh, health and nutrition uh, uh, information and Black Infant Health and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also hooked up with some of the other, uh, like I say, grassroots organizations that people don't know about, people wouldn't work with. Uh, some of these grassroots organizations that were born out of the street nations that people don't know about. Uh, we make sure, like I said, we connect all of these different areas of the community, bring it in. And then more importantly, making sure that the uh, the kids, they can see this work, they can see it happening. They can see all of these different people from around the community coming in to be a part of this process. And the, the, the last thing I'll say, and just to be honest, uh, historically, we have uh, different groups within our community for different reasons. Um, and most of them, uh, white supremacy, COINTEL, pro and so on and so forth. Let me be very clear with that. But different reasons we have, we have been uh, separated. So those generations, those people are older than me. Uh, those people have uh, contention, they have issues for whatever reason, right? But some of the younger folks coming in who, who we went to school with or who we played ball with or whatever the case may be, this brother may be a part of this church. Now, me being a member of the House of San Sankofa, historically, we wouldn't get together. But uh, him and I had some issues or she and I had some issues and we came together to, uh, to partner up to, to deal with those issues. So there's a respect there, there's a love there, and there's a trust there. Uh, like I said before, we organized Hood Patrol, taking a uh, taking from what we saw our, our elders, the Black Panther Party do, we did Hood Patrol. So a lot of the folks in the community know me for being arrested and jumped by the police and still getting bailed out and going the same night, going out there to do the work. So that, that solidarity, that love, that respect, that really been in the trenches, they see that even though I'm a so-called CEO and all this other stuff, or I got my degree, I'm not away from the people. And that's what we teach the kids at Kakua. No matter where you are, who you are, what you are, you are as, as important as anybody else in this room. And we teach the kids, everything about our curriculum is teaching that confidence building, teaching them about who they are, teaching them the truth about the things that they did right and the things that we did wrong as a people. So as they grow up, they can develop those strategies, those plans, that platform to ensure that we're liberated for good. Uh, we're not looking for pieces of liberation. We're not looking for uh, um, uh, victories in these corners and so on and so forth. We're trying to have a total victory and we know that it's gonna, uh, that's gonna involve the youth. It's also gonna involve the elders and everyone in between. So Kaku is that space for us to come in and have those conversations, do that work, uh, uh, have those debates, those dialogues, and like I said, those discussions and really, really, really have that space. And, and as much as we talk about political work and cultural work and spiritual work and all of that, we also allow uh, Kaku to be a space to have fun. This mom or this dad can't afford to take their kids to this big old space and have this stuff. Well, we have, uh, what do you call it, a, a jumper? We have a jumper, we have our center, we have tables, we have chairs, we provide the food, we provide everything. All we ask the parents to do is bring their kids uh, and, and invite the folks. We make sure that our, our families have the opportunity to do all the things that uh, uh, we need to do without being reliant upon this system that has done everything. As much as we run to the system, uh, oh my goodness, they meet us with a boot every time. So we say, forget running to them. Let's figure out how to be focused uh, on ourselves, self-determination. How do we build our, our, our youth up? How do we build up our, our uh, ability, our, our ability to really, really uh, attack some of these issues? And like I say, you can't attack these issues from this intellectual group over here or the street nations over there or the professionals over there. Everybody has different skills they bring to the table. And once again, uh, Kakua has been a focal point of connecting folks, bringing people to the table so we can address uh, this beast collectively and, and not splintered. We want to make sure that we hit them with a full tree and not splinters of the tree. And that's what we're about here at Kakua. Uh, thank you no, all for no the splinters, opportunity. Splinters, wonderful. No splinters, no branches, no twigs, but an entire tree. And a tree is just a wonderful metaphor because we're talking this evening about roots. And certainly you give us a beautiful example of the internal uh, alliances that can help us be stronger. So it's, it's, it's a strong tree uh, as opposed to uh, just a weak seed, uh, seedling. And this has been an incredible conversation. Uh, Brother Mamut, 
and uh, Sister Rosemary uh, with her partner, um, Sam Anderson, uh, partners in that struggle. And then of course, Sister uh, Jeanette Taylor, you all are really truly living legacies. And it's an honor to have uh, shared this space with you. I would like to thank Hot House, uh, hothouse.net, if you would like to follow up. I'd like to thank the Literacy Project, literacyproject.org, uh, Catherine Murphy's uh, organization that has done some trailblazing work about uh, how we can share stories about educational achievements, educational movements, and uh, also Rita, Dr. Rita Sakai, who has been a part of this team, as well as Peter Kuttner and Vidran, who is the filmographer. So thank you to each of you who were part of the team for these seven months. And um, I hope you had a great evening and we'll see you perhaps in the fall. We might have a, an encore. Thank you. Paulo Freire é educação Pensar transforma, muda É abolição Freiriana é sua missão Pensar transforma, muda É evolução O conhecimento liberta Vamos transformar Educar o mundo de dentro pra fora interpretar Mundo líquido Monolítico A solução é alfabetizar, é reinventar Me dê a mão e vamos